Okay, good. Uh, so let me introduce myself. I'm Stephen Greenblatt. Uh, I'm talking to you from uh, the state of Vermont uh, in the United States, in the northeast of America, uh, in New England, uh, and where all I'm in a rural area where all is quiet. Uh, but as you know, uh, things are not necessarily quiet uh, anywhere, everywhere in my country at the moment. Uh, and we are experiencing a situation with which you, I'm afraid, are also familiar, where things are, are uh, in disorder. Um, there's an old uh, Chinese curse, I believe, may you live in interesting times. So we're living in interesting times, and I hope that we return to less interesting times uh, in that sense fairly soon. Um, in any case, I'm very happy to be with you uh, today to talk about Othello. And I think what I will do will be to uh, see if I can share my screen with you. Uh, so I'm going to uh, now hope that it works and then I'll use it as a way of talking about this remarkable uh, play. Uh, let's see. And if I go up here to slideshow. Now, uh, I hope you can tell me if it isn't working, but I hope that you see my screen, uh, which yes, has it's a, working. It's working. Oh, Thank you. That has a picture of, of a recent fairly recent film, not so recent, uh, of the play. The uh, Othello has uh, been made many times uh, in the variety, all over the world, uh, and this is a, uh, a, I think, quite successful uh, modern film uh, with Lawrence Fishburne, the actor playing uh, Othello, uh, and uh, with a sort of a powerful and somewhat, uh, as always, disturbing uh, uh, Iago, uh, played by a uh, celebrated British actor. Um, the, I want to talk a little bit about the play historically, and I'm aware that you're interested in it from a colonial, colonial and post-colonial view, so I'll try to say things uh, that are relevant to that. Uh, I won't go on, I hope, for too long because I'm very eager for quest to answer questions that you have and also to ask you some questions. Uh, but I'll start just by talking a little bit about the play uh, as we've received it from Shakespeare's time. It was a play written uh, in the early years, we don't know exactly when, of the 17th century, 1601, 1602, probably. Uh, could be a little bit later, three or four. It wasn't published until the first time in print until this edition called the Quarto, that just meant a small scale, like a paperback edition in 1622, uh, after Shakespeare was dead already. Shakespeare died in 1616. But his name, as you can see, is prominently featured. The tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice. Uh, as it had been diverse times, that means many times acted at the Globe and at the Blackfriars by His Majesty's servants. And then it was published again in print the following year in the huge volume called The First Folio in 1623. Uh, again, as you see, the tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice. And I show you both of those because I will explain to you uh, in a minute uh, that there are, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but that there are small but interesting differences between the two uh, different texts of the play that make, uh, that make a significant difference at a certain point. And I'll, I could explain to you why scholars think that the differences came about in the first place, but in the case of Othello, it's possible that Shakespeare wrote it, that, that he went back and changed, changed some things. Uh, and but it's not known which version is the final version. So it could be the the 
small version or could be this big uh, version. In any case, I'll come back to that issue. Uh, this was a play written uh, for the part of Othello to be played by uh, a by one of the actors in Shakespeare's company. We happen to know the actor who created the role. His name is Richard Burbage. And the uh, important thing here to say uh, is that the play was written for an actor, as you can see, who was a, um, uh, a white uh, English actor, Richard Burbage, who created the part and he created lots of other great parts in Shakespeare's play. Uh, the reason I say that is that, that uh, there is an ongoing and unresolved uh, discussion among uh, scholars about what it is that Shakespeare imagined the Moor to be, whether he was uh, a clearly a foreigner, clearly a stranger in Shakespeare, to, to Shakespeare's world, uh, the world of, of uh, Elizabethan England, but whether he was a uh, uh, someone from the Middle East or from more likely North Africa or south of Sahara, that's not so clear. What is known is that in the year 1600, uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth received an ambassador uh, from uh, what was uh, the, the territory then of the Kingdom of Morocco. The this man who had his portrait, as you can see, painted quite remarkably when he was in England in 1600, uh, Abd al-Wakhid ben Masoud ben Mohammed al-Anuri. Uh, he was the Moroccan ambassador. As you can see from the portrait, it says he's 42 years old when he was visiting in 1600. And he dressed in the uh, in the manner of a diplomat of uh, his period, with a uh, with a, a sword by his side, uh, and he was the object of considerable attention in 1600. So it is thought as one possibility when why Shakespeare would have written a play about a Moor for the popular theater. Uh, in the early 17th century that it was excited by this visit um, from a Moorish ambassador. Why was the ambassador there? Because Queen Elizabeth actually for now some years before he came had been conducting negotiations with a number of uh, Muslim powers uh, with the, she had ongoing relations with the, with the uh, powerful Turks but also with, with uh, uh, countries in North Africa. And this was part of a global strategy on her part because England was uh, in an ongoing uh, on and off war with Spain. And the idea was uh, that, that actually al Anuri brought was that uh, England could form an alliance with Morocco uh, to uh, put pressure, military pressure, on the Spaniards. And that would enable, uh, from the point of view of the North African powers, would enable the Maghreb to get some power back uh, in some territory back in Spain, which they had lost uh, after 1492. It didn't actually turn out, the, the negotiation didn't turn out to be particularly uh, effective or successful, but that was what was going on. Okay, so this kind of figure could have been in the mind of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there were some uh, sub-Saharan Africans uh, in, also in England, small numbers, again, very small numbers, but there were some, and now there's actually in the last few years been very interesting work done by scholars about these uh, Africans who were in, uh, London, uh, as some, many of them as musicians, actually, but also as, as uh, uh, tradespeople, craftspeople, not, in, as I say, not in large numbers, but they also would have been possible references for Shakespeare to imagine uh, who his Othello was, would have looked like. Okay, 
Uh, Iago, who is the villain, the principal villain in the play, uh, refers to Othello often in racist terms and uh, uh, emphasizes his blackness. Even now, now, very now, he says uh, to the old man Brabantio, the father of Desdemona, an old black ram is tupping your white you, is, is uh, copulating with your daughter, an old black ram. So there's a, there's a, uh, there is some racist language in the play. And I think quite interestingly, the racist language is always from uh, the villain uh, and his sidekick, Iago and Rodrigo. But it may suggest that uh, the character of Othello was imagined to be a sub-Saharan, uh, not a, uh, uh, a Arab. Okay, there, there was a, the, the, the a part of Othello, as they say, was created by a white actor and it was, has a, was a long tradition for hundreds of years that the part was played uh, by celebrated uh, white actors dress, putting on blackface, uh, as here Laurence Olivier, famous 20th century English actor, uh, I happen to see playing this part uh, back in the 1980s, uh, put on uh, charcoal on his face, black makeup on his face to look look like uh, Sub-Saharan African. Now that's very infrequently done any longer. In the United States would never, I think, uh, be done. Uh, and already in the 19th century, uh, an African-American, the, the son of, a, of some of former slaves named Ira Aldrich was the first black man who played Othello. He wasn't able to play it in the United States because of, of racism in America in the 19th century, and he played, but he went to England and he performed the part uh, in England and actually in Europe. Um, the most famous Othello in the 20th century uh, was this Othello by an American, uh, African-American actor, a great actor named Paul Robeson. Uh, and uh, did a sensational and important uh, production uh, of Othello uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Okay, uh, we can come back to uh, this, uh, this set of questions, but I wanna start just by talking about Othello as, a, uh, as an outsider. The world that Shakespeare depicts in the play has uh, has a, a set of different groups. It begins with the Venetians uh, trying to uh, negotiate uh, or calculate a military strategy against their enemies, the Turks. Of course, the, the Venetians and the Turks were the, in the, uh, all through actually the 16th century, the great military opponents, but also they were in contact with one another in the, in the uh, 15th and 16th century. Um, in any case, there's this global opposition between the Christian Venetians and the Muslim Turks. And then there's this peculiar character of an outsider. So not someone from within the Venetian world or within the larger Italian, Christian Italian world, but from outside that world, namely Othello, who is working for the Venetians, who is a, uh, the principal commander uh, for the Venetian forces against the Turks. And Othello is unmistakably an outsider, not only in his skin color, but in his whole appearance, in his whole uh, way of being in the world, but he's inside at the same time in the, the forces of Venice. And that notion of being an outsider and an insider is crucially important in the play. At what we learn uh, early in the play, when Othello is giving an account of how uh, he and Desdemona came to know each other and love each other, is that Desdemona's father, who was an important uh, Venetian nobleman, uh, a part of the Venetian Senate. Uh, Venice had an oligarchy with a, with a group of powerful senators at the top. And 
Desdemona's father, Brabantio, was one of them. A fellow says, her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life, still means kept asking me over and over again, still questioned me the story of my life from year to year, the battles, sieges, fortunes that I have passed. So the situation is one in which you have to picture a, an exotic outsider who is invited repeatedly to come to the house of a powerful Venetian senator and tell the story of his life uh, over and over again. You can imagine as you wish how someone like this or how you would respond if someone asks you to tell you the, to tell the story of your life uh, as a kind of dinner guest, uh, a form of entertainment. Perhaps he was happy to do it. Perhaps he laughed, uh, a fellow laughed to himself about it. In any case, he did it. He, uh, he, he performed his life, as it were, uh, for this powerful Venetian uh, senator. He says, I ran it through, even from my boyish days, to the very moment that he bade me tell it. So he tells the whole story of his life from his childhood up to the moment that he's in, in Venice. And that a, was a extraordinary life, in, uh, an, a life of a, a danger and adventure in uh, the account that Othello gives, wherein I spoke of most disastrous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hairbreadth scapes, in the imminent deadly breach, he's been involved in terrifying military encounters, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence, importance in my travailous history. The history uh, has a history of travail, of work, of danger, uh, of being sold into slavery. Notice that he doesn't say uh, who the insolent foe is exactly. Uh, or who had enslaved him, or who had redeemed him. Uh, this is just the context uh, of an exotic story, exciting uh, personal uh, adventure that has led Othello to being uh, where he is. But, and this is actually quite important, I think, as we can, as we, I can show you or we can see, uh, it's clear that Othello, whatever his past was, uh, he, uh, is clearly in some sense associated with uh, Muslims, in some sense associated with pagans, called a pagan at one point in the play, but he is now a Christian. Uh, so he has been converted uh, to Christianity, and he's, after all, fighting on behalf of the Venetian Christians. But he has this past. Okay. When he tells this past, Desdemona would seriously inclined. She'd lean forward to hear him, but still always the house affairs would draw her thence, whichever she could with haste dispatch, she'd come again and with a greedy ear devour up my discourse. So as he recalls what happened uh, in the household, he, noted, he has this rather strange image of her eating up his account and, uh, she obviously has loved his account of his life. It's incredibly exciting to her. And there's something at once, to him, there's something at once gratifying and almost alarming by the intensity with which she eats up, devours up what he is saying. All right. Um, my story being done, he, he says, she gave me for my pains a world of size. This is one of those moments I told you at the, the beginning that there were two different texts, one called Q by scholars, one called F for quarto and folio. So in the quarto, she gave me a world of size. In the folio, she gave me for my pains a world of kisses. And that's a kind of change that, that scholars actually have, are curious about. Was it size or kisses? Did she, uh, did she uh, feel sorry for him or was she uh, aroused by him? She swore in faith to a strange, she's passing strange. She wished she hadn't heard it. 
She wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me and bade me if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story and that would woo her. And the fellow is not stupid. He, he gets the hint upon this hint I spake. She has invited him to woo her. Okay. Um, I'll go back to that remark that he, met, he made about his travailless history. And again, that's one of those changes. The, tr it, the word is travailless in the, in the quarter, which is an unusual word meaning a, a history of travail, of labor, or a struggle. But in the folio, it's my traveler's history. And I'll come back to travelers in a second. And he describes some of the ad adventures that he told that had wooed, that wound up wooing Desdemona. We're in of antras vast and caves vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills whose heads touch heaven. It was my hint to speak. Such was my process. And of the cannibals that each other eat, the anthropophagi and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. Now, that kind of story, that kind of travel tale was very, very popular in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance precisely as an emblem of the exotic, of what lies beyond the known horizon. And Othello seems to be the personal bearer of this extraordinary exotic history. And we know that Shakespeare got this kind of account from uh, work, uh, from a number of different sources, but principally from this, uh, I think, remarkable work uh, by uh, the, from, the, from the 14th century, so a long, long time before, 150 years before Shakespeare wrote his play, called Mandeville's Travels. Mandeville's Travels is a kind of medieval imaginary tale of what the world was like once you got beyond your little hometown. What happens when you leave Vermont, where I am now, and go first uh, to New York and then perhaps to South America and then uh, to you wind up in Africa and then you you're in Palestine and then you're in Europe you see the world in a vastly different way and in the medieval story 14th century people obviously weren't uh, able to travel uh, the for the most part you get wilder and wilder accounts including the kind of things that that uh, Othello reports in his experience, ugly folk without heads, people with eyes in their shoulders, mouths in the, uh, in the middle of their chests, headless men and so forth. And in medieval manuscripts of Mandeville's travels, you get images like that, which is clearly what Othello is referring to. Something exotic that lies beyond the horizon of your expectation. But the other thing about Mandeville's travels, which was the most famous European travel book uh, that, and certainly known to Shakespeare, because he has Othello refer to it, is, is I think quite interesting in terms of what we want to talk about today, about colonialism and post-colonialism. <clears throat> Mandeville's travels is a Christian account, uh, as you would expect, <clears throat> from written in France, but attributed to England. And it's very much about trying to get the, especially the Holy Land back, to get the, the Jerusalem back, to get the sites of, of, of uh, the Christian religion back from the hands of the Muslims. Um, and that Mandeville's Travels is full of a kind of dream of, of uh, another crusade to recover the Holy Land. But the curious thing about this is that it isn't only a, an account of a triumph over uh, the hated enemies. The folk, he says, who dwell in that country are called Numidians, and they're Christian. He's talking about the people who are in, now he's talking about people in, in Africa, but he's talking about the Christian Africa before the part, the part of Christian Africa, a part of Africa that hadn't been completely converted to Islam. But they're black in color, he says, and they consider that a great beauty. And the blacker they are, the fairer they seem to each other. And they say that if they were to paint an angel and a devil, they'd paint the angel black and the devil white. So already, even in this text, which is basically a kind of uh, a, 
a fantasy of a text of Christian triumph again over the Muslim sites, there's also a peculiar beginning of reversal that actually it, it, Mandeville tells his readers in the 14th century that in some parts of the world, the values are the reverse of what you think the values, we think the values would be. And then he has an account of talking to the Sultan, the Muslim uh, potentate, and he claims, this is all fantasy, this is all made up, but he claims that he talked to the Sultan. And here he says, I want to tell you what the Sultan told me upon a day in his chamber. He asked me how the Christian men govern themselves in our country. And I said to him, right well, thank be to God. And he, the Sultan said to me, truly no, nay. In Mandeville's account, the Sultan goes on to explain that he knows perfectly well that the Christians behave extremely badly, that they're hypocritical, they're sinful, and so forth and so on. This is a Christian text, and Mandeville, the writer, goes on and says, it's a great slander to our faith and to our law as Christians, when folk that be without law, as he imagines the Muslims to be, shall reprove us of our sins. And he goes on, they're saying the truth, truly they say truth, for the Saracens, the Muslims, be good and faithful, for they keep entirely the commandment of the holy book, Al-Quran, that God sent them by his messenger, Muhammad. So what I want you to get is that, on the one hand, in the world that, the ideological world that Shakespeare inherited, there is a kind of absolute opposition between Christian and Muslim, also between Christian and Jew. I mean, there are a bunch, a set of absolute oppositions, ferocious oppositions, but under the surface, there are underminings. It's possible for people, even in a situation in which one person hates the other and is set against the other, it's possible for people to begin to think for themselves or begin to doubt or begin to think that the world no, is no, not... Can you, permission. Can, you, can you, if you could mute yourself, that would be good. Um, if it, it's possible, even in that world, for people to begin to think differently. And that's what Shakespeare's play is all about, thinking differently. So where did Shakespeare get these ideas? Partly, as I say, he got them from, from Mandeville's travels, but he also got them from another source. He got them from this re a remarkable book by this man, Al-Hassan ibn Muhammad al-Wazan al-Fasi, uh, uh, an astonishing figure from whom Shakespeare and his contemporaries learned much of what they knew about the, uh, the African world and the Muslim world. This was a remarkable person who wrote a book called The Description of Africa in the middle of the 16th century. And Shakespeare again read this book in translation. And the author of the book had a whole set of different names. Al-Hazan al-Wazan, we've already seen. He was also sometimes called Johannes Leo, sometimes called Giovanni Leone, sometimes called Leo Africanus, sometimes called John Leo Amor, and then sometimes called Johanna al -Assad. So why does he have so many names? Because he's a kind of uh, shape changer. He was captured. Al-Hazan al-Wazan was, was a North African who was captured by the Christians. He converted to Christianity. He wrote a description of Africa in the 16th century that was widely uh, that was widely read, and then he escaped back to North Africa and converted back to Islam. So he kept changing his shape, as it were. And what I want you to this is from the English translation that Shakespeare would have worked. What I want you to again understand is that under the surface of opposition, global opposition between Christian and Muslim there's a much more complicated picture because uh, the, the introduction to the uh, description of Africa by this man, John Pory, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare, says that we wouldn't have known about these travels had he not been a Moor and a Mohammedan in religion and most skillful in the languages, uh, and had he not encountered so many imminent dangers. He's a kind of figure like Othello, who has brought information from the other world to us. How did he escape, John Pori says, all of these adventures? How many desolate cold mountains? How many huge dry and barren deserts passed he? And so forth and so on. He writes uh, about uh, Leo Africanus, about Alhazan 
of Ozan as if he were Othello. And I think that's where Shakespeare got some of his notion of what, how to construct the character of Othello. And in the description of Africa written by uh, Alazan Ozan, uh, he, uh, he writes that these Africans which inhabit Barbary, North Africa, are honest people, destitute of fraud and guile, means they, they're not, they're honest, they don't have, they're not deceivers, not only embracing all simplicity and truth, but also practicing the same throughout the whole of their course of their lives, even though certain Latin authors, meaning Christian authors, have, uh, are of a different opinion. It's not true. These, these figures, these Muslims from North Africa are decent, honest people. They're strong and valiant, he says, especially the ones that dwell on the mountains. They keep their covenant most faithfully, insomuch that they'd rather die than break promise. Uh, and the only negative thing, he says, well, the principal negative thing is that no nation in the world is so subject unto jealousy, for they will rather lose their lives than put up with any disgrace in behalf of their women. So that's the picture. That's the material that Shakespeare was working with in constructing this figure, this ambiguous figure who comes from a different world and who comes, who's in our world, the world of, of Venetian Christians. And it's that ambiguity that his principal enemy, Iago, is able to play on. And I just cite that one word, indeed, because if you've read the play at all carefully, you'll know that Othello uh, begins to, to fall into his terrible, catastrophic uh, jealousy just with a single word that Iago uses, indeed. Did, did, did Michael Cassio go wooing with you? Yes, he did, indeed. And uh, Othello asks Iago, Why do you, what, what do you mean by indeed? Why are you saying indeed? And then Iago manages to unfold all of his demonic, uh, devilish uh, plot against uh, Othello. Uh, by heaven, I'll know your thoughts. Iago says, you cannot of my heart with were in your hand, nor shall not, while it is in my custody. Ha! says Othello, and Iago says, oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. Beware. And that's how he brings the jealousy up to the surface that he believes that, that uh, Othello has as part of his uh, native character. He says, uh, he, he, he has a kind of version, Iago, in other words, of what, what Al-Hazan Al-Wazan said about the the uh, North Africans in general, Muslims of North Africa, honest, decent, committed to their truth, but subject to jealousy. Um, okay, a couple of other quick things I want to say, and then I'm going to stop and take your questions. Shakespeare took his story from an Italian, the core story from an Italian named Giraldi Cintio. This is a, uh, what, it, what it looks like, a little, a very short story about a Uptano Moro. Uh, Moorish captain, but uh, he's, uh, Giraldi Cinto, the Italian source says almost nothing about, about what it is to be a Moor or whether he's black. It's just a, that's just a designation. He's not really interested in it uh, very much. He doesn't do anything with it or the way that Shakespeare does. Uh, but he, but the source does have that peculiar handkerchief in it. Tell me about this. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? That handkerchief, which is the the device that Iago uses to trap uh, Othello um, by telling Othello that uh, I saw Cassio wipe his beard uh, with it. Okay, um, that's the trick. And we could, if we have time, we can talk a little, little bit about why that uh, handkerchief worked the way it works and why Othello says that handkerchief did an Egyptian to my mother give. She was a charmer and could almost read the thoughts of people. Desdemona is horrified by that. Is it possible? Tis true. There's magic in the web of it, he says. There's magic in the web of it. We, if we have time, as I say, we can talk a little more about why the play turns on this peculiar, that this peculiar object, just a handkerchief. No one, no one takes a handkerchief very seriously, very hard to make a play out of a handkerchief, but Shakespeare does. Um, couple of other things to say before we stop. 
<clears throat> and take questions. Desdemona is extraordinarily frank and open in her love for uh, Othello, including her physical love for Othello. Her desire for him, of the more to live with him, my downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet to the world, she says, my heart subdued even to the utmost pleasure of my Lord. So Desdemona is not a completely uh, enclosed, quiet creature. She's able to stand up and speak for herself. And one thing we might suggest is the reasons that Iago is able to persuade Othello of his lies, Desdemona's faithful to him, is that he's able to work on Desdemona being unusually frank and candid about, and her interest in serving his pleasure. Uh, and at the great moment in Act Two in which they, uh, they see each other, uh, for the after being separated, Othello speaks with extraordinary love for her. Uh, so absolute that not another comfort like to this succeeds in unknown faith. His feeling of love and pleasure and desire is so intense that he wants to stop there to die, and she. Uh, and he says repeatedly to her, I will deny thee nothing. And she says, oh, this is not a boon. It's as if I should ask you to wear your gloves or feed on nourishing dishes or keep you warm. She never has that feeling of, I can't stand any more of this. It's too much for me. She just says, no, no, we can take pleasure with each other. We can, we can give each other what we need. Uh, and that helps Iago to turn... Othello against her, to think that she's a whore. Are you not a strumpet, a whore? No, she says, as I'm a Christian. I'm no strumpet. Not a whore, he says. He, he, he moves from her as his ultimate love, which she is, as we know, and as he knew at that point, to thinking that she's a whore that she's unfaithful. And that's the mystery of the play. That's the pivot of the play and how it works. And then when he, at, when he goes to kill her in Act 5, he thinks he's killing her as a kind of religious act, an act of justice, but a kind of religious justice. Have you prayed tonight, Desdemon? I, my lord. If you bethink yourself of any crime, he says, unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace, solicit for it straight. He wants her to confess, to confess in prayer, the way that Christians were meant to uh, confess, the way he says he confesses. Um, Until she come as truly as to heaven, I do confess the vices of my blood, he says. He's always spoken as a good Christian this way. So I'll present how I did in my latest summer. And he has has absorbed that sense of what it is to be a good Christian. Early in the play, he, he turns it to his fellow soldiers and said, are we turned Turks and to ourselves do that which heaven hath forbid the Ottomites? Well, are we struggling as if we are Turks for Christian shame put by this barbarous blood? He, he tries to speak from within Christianity as someone who's converted to Christianity. Uh, and that is the trick I want to suggest that Iago uses, because the interest, I think, the deep interest that uh, Shakespeare had is in a structure that has, we have friends, the Venetians, we have enemies, the Turks, we have the outsider, uh, the outsider Othello who's come into a world of insiders. And the form of the play makes you think that the great war is between the insiders and the outsiders. But the cunning of the play is to reveal that the real danger comes from inside. The thing that destroys Othello comes not from the Turks, not from the Muslims. It comes from his second in command, his best friend, his fellow officer, 
it comes from within the world of the insiders that tricks him into destroying uh, for loving, destroying someone who loves him, destroying her because she loves him. And I want to just uh, close uh, end of the play when the fellow asks, will you demand that demi-devil, Iago, why he hath thus ensnared my soul and body? And Iago says, don't ask me anything. Demand me nothing. What you know, you know from this time forth, I never will speak word, and he never says anything else. So we never know, we never get an account from him as to why he's done this. What we do get an account at the very end of the play is of Othello's feelings at the end. And here is a very peculiar difference between the two different texts of the play, the quarto and the folio. In the quarto, just before he's, I mean, in the, uh, just before he's committing suicide, he gives a speech that says, just set down, don't set anything in malice, just set down what, uh, what actually happened. Then must you speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well, of one not easily jealous, but being wrought, being made to be jealous, perplexed in the extreme, of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribe. I just want to focus on that phrase, like the base Indian. So in this phrase, in this reading, Othello is like one of those Indians in, I think the reference here is probably in, not to India in East Asia, but to the West Indies, to India in the Americas, where the Europeans were able to trick, as they understood it, to trick the natives to give very valuable things, pearls, uh, away to them in exchange for nothing. So he was one, Othello was likening himself to one of those naive outsiders, one of those uh, people who don't understand, who is tricked into throwing a pearl away, uh, which was the most valuable thing uh, in his tribe. And here's the alternative which is the folio text. And all of this depends on the fact, as you can see from the word jealous in the middle of the reading, that the English at this point don't use the, the English spelling doesn't use a J, it only uses an I. One not easily jealous, but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme, of one whose hand like the base Judean, here it's not Indian, but base Judean, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribe. So here's a different reading. He's the base Judean. So what is a base Judean as opposed to a base Indian? A base Judean is not a West Indian, not a stranger that way. It's uh, someone from Judea, that is to say, uh, from that area of the Middle East. And a base Judean in Shakespeare's time would have been understood to refer to a Jew, and namely to Judas, who betrayed Jesus to throw a pearl away richer than all his tribe. So we get these two different readings, base Judean, base Indian and base Judean. And that is part of the background to what Othello was thinking when he finally concludes this speech by committing suicide. And when he concludes the speech by committing suicide, he says, say besides that in Aleppo once, he's recalling a battle he was once in, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. And then he kills himself. So where I want to leave these very introductory remarks about who's inside, who's outside, who is the stranger, who is the enemy, is at the end of the play, Othello imagines himself as a Christian warrior fighting against a Muslim, evidently, uh, a Muslim or uh, a malignant and a turban Turk, and also has imagined himself as a base Judean, a Jew. Uh, circumcised a dog could apply to either the Muslims or the Jew. So you get a vision at the end of the play in which the hero, having been tricked by the Christian by his Christian friend, 
uh, takes vengeance on himself by killing himself as if he were a Muslim or a Jew on behalf of the uh, Venetian state. Now, what I want to ask you is what Shakespeare wanted you to think at this point. What do you think has happened? Does Shakespeare approve of this suicide? Does Shakespeare think that it was appropriate to, uh, as a good Christian, to kill a Muslim uh, or a Jew? Or does he think something else has happened? And I will stop here, go back to you as a group, uh, to the gallery view. And now I welcome uh, your questions and your comments, uh, anything that you want to ask. Um, and you could, um, uh, Rifat, I don't know if you're on now, but we could do it. Can you speak still? Can I hear you? No, not yet. Uh, it doesn't matter, but you could send me, uh, use the, if you use the chat function, you could send me a question on chat, okay? Uh, so any questions that you have, I will see um, on the screen. And what I really want to ask you, good, I agree, Rafat, let's see what questions the students have first. My question to you is what do you think the play is asking you to think at the end? What do you think that the play, do you think the play thinks the tri it's a triumph to kill uh, a Muslim or a Jew, as a, if you're a good Christian or not? But let's let's see what what you think. And you don't have to be shy. You can ask me anything that you like. Because the problem, uh, the, the question, if I understand it uh, from Ahmed, is, is, uh, is the problem being African or being black or both? In other words, is the problem being <clears throat> an outsider? Uh, I mean, to what extent is being black an issue in the play? To what extent is being African being an outsider? So I would say this. As I said at the very beginning, I think it's very significant that all of the racist accounts, the account of being black, of being thick-lipped and so forth, all of this comes from the wickedest characters in the play, the evil characters in the play, and especially from Iago. Nothing that Iago says should be taken uh, as uh, the necessarily the truth, and certainly not as the truth of what we're supposed to feel. I think as an audience, we're supposed to feel disgusted by Iago, hostile to Iago. Iago is a horrible character. He's really one of the most evil characters that Shakespeare ever imagined. So insofar as the language of the play attacks Othello as a black, I think we're to understand this as racist uh, language from a villain, not as, how should we say, collective values that we're all meant to share. But the question in addition uh, about being African, that is a less, uh, I think that's less uh, sharply clear in the play because there are two ways of thinking about it. Maybe more than two, but two ways I can think about it. Uh, on the one hand, um, well, let me go back. Can we consider Iago's racism as Shakespeare's voice? And my answer to that is unequivocally no. Uh, we absolutely can't think of uh, Iago's racism as Shakespeare's voice. I think the play makes very clear that the locus of real value in the play, of what we care about in the play, is in Othello and Desdemona. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're black or white. On the contrary, the locus of evil in the play is Iago, who is the very opposite in, it, in, in that sense of anything that we are asked to approve of or embrace. I think the play makes clear that Iago is 
pathological, that he's in the grip of a kind of pathological racist hatred uh, of Othello. And that he, such a racist hatred, in fact, one of the strange things about Iago is he actually, in effect, has ruined himself. He, he has had a perfectly good position. He is, he is uh, Iago's assistant, then he becomes the lieutenant, and he keeps going, keeps going, because he can't stop. Even when he has a good thing going, even when he gets what he wants, he still hates Othello so much that he destroys himself in order to destroy Othello. I mean, part of, I think, the most powerful underlying vision of the play is that if you're in the grip of a pathological hatred, as Iago is in the grip of a pathological hatred of Othello, you can destroy yourself in the attempt to destroy the object of your hatred. That's a disaster, a catastrophe. Um, I'll go to the next question. I think Shakespeare is being kind of biased in his ending. He's Christian and a white privileged man after all. I don't think Shakespeare wanted to promote change of how people used to view black and Muslim people of his time. Because if he did, no white men would have played Othello's role when it was written. I would say two things. First of all, it is always possible. Shakespeare's plays are possible to do in lots of different ways. Uh, it's possible to play Shakespeare's plays uh, to Othello in, uh, with a hundred different interpretations. Otherwise, it wouldn't have, have lasted for the last 400 years. The play is huge in its range of implications. <clears throat> so in terms of the question, the very interesting question that uh, you, I was just asked, is it possible that a, I mean, you're absolutely right that, that Othello was played in the entirely racist way, for example, in the American South uh, in uh, the, the 19th century, uh, where the, the, the play, in fact, uh, e although it disturbed people uh, in, in that racist world, none the, because it had a black man kissing a white woman, uh, which was also in South Africa during apartheid time, nonetheless, it was played. So it was possible to interpret in a, uh, as the question suggests, in a racist way. But I, as I tried to show you at the beginning, even within the logic the anti-Muslim, anti-Black uh, logic of the Middle Ages uh, in Mandeville's travels or in uh, the texts about Africa in the 16th century, they're already ambivalent. And they're already, it's already possible to begin to undermine uh, the official view. Look, countries have official views. The leaders tell you to believe this. The, the, the rulers, the officials of all kinds tell you, this is the way you have to believe. You have to walk down this little narrow path. But actually, most people live in a more complicated way with alternative views and secret accounts. And we already saw in Mandeville's travels, and I think you see very powerfully in Shakespeare, that if there's an official view, I don't think it is actually Shakespeare's official view, but let's imagine that there's an official view uh, and let's say, as one of your interesting questions, uh, the questions about Desdemona's father suggests, that the official view is that official view of Desdemona's father, who also speaks in, as the question suggests, in racist language about Othello. Although he's invited Othello to his house many times, he loves Othello, but he's in, but still, uh, when he, especially when he's angry, he speaks in racist terms. But the play doesn't endorse that view. The play suggests that that father never understood his daughter, never really understood Othello, uh, was, uh, was broken hearted, lost his daughter, I mean, uh, to, to uh, the man he didn't want her to marry. But the play doesn't endorse the idea that, that Brabantio, that father, has the truth about Othello. On the contrary, 
I think the play goes out of its way to suggest that Othello is a remarkably decent person, though he's manipulable. He's able, Iago is able to turn him uh, into uh, the destroyer of his own happiness by destroying his wife. Actually, now I probably shouldn't uh, come completely come clean about my own view, but I will. I think, Dr. Green, like, let me just say one uh, thing. Can I say one thing, Eichmann? Yes, please. Yes. I think that, I think that the play sees the real dark disturbance, the pathological disturbance, not in black or white, not in Muslim or Jew or Christian. He sees it in the relation of men to women. I think that the play thinks that there's something fundamentally wrong with men in their relation to women. And that the play keeps identifying, and the, the core of it is Iago, but then he manages to get Othello in it as well, and he manages to get Cassio in it too. The play <clears throat> suggests that there's something disturbed and disturbing in male responses to females, to men's responses to women, that there's something murderous in men. Ah, Eichmann, please. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Greenblatt. Uh, uh, my name is Ayman Blatt. I teach Shakespeare as well as uh, other courses at the Islamic University. It has been an honor, an honor to meet you, actually. I have always heard about, about uh, you, and this is, I'm really privileged and uh, really happy to have a class uh, by Stephen Greenblatt. Uh, my question uh, regarding the, 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 the voice of William Shakespeare as being a racist is in connection uh, with another play, which is actually The Merchant of Venice. In The Merchant of Venice, many people, they accuse William Shakespeare as being a racist, although you, yeah, we cannot consider him as a racist in Othello. Uh, what is the difference uh, between considering Shakespeare as a racist in uh, The Merchant of Venice because of what he said, uh, I mean, on the tongue of other characters, and we don't consider him as a racist here in Othello. Yes. It's a very interesting question, Ayman. Um, I've written a lot about uh, The Merchant of Venice. I find The Merchant of Venice a very disturbing play, a, a powerful play, but a disturbing play. Uh, it, it, Shakespeare, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, Shakespeare, and perhaps it's connected to the way he was a powerful playwright, Shakespeare likes to play with dangerous materials, explosive materials. I think Shakespeare all his life liked to experiment with, with uh, combustible things. He did it in Titus Andronicus with the character of Aaron the Moor. He does it in, uh, in the Tempest with Caliban, the, Cal the cannibal. Yes. And he does it uh, to an extreme degree, as you suggest, in yes. The Merchant of Venice, both with Shylock, the Jew, and yes. with Morocco, uh, the, the Muslim. Uh, right. uh, so I think he liked it. He is a popular playwright entertaining thousands of people. It would be possible to argue about The Merchant of Venice that Shakespeare is anti-Semitic uh, and racist. So as it's possible to argue, as several of you have suggested, it's possible I, to I, argue I, I, in I, I, I but I don't think so. Yeah, what has been said, I mean, it was said on the tongue of other characters. It is exactly as what, what is said about the Moor and the Arabs, right, on the tongue of Iago. Uh, yet, I do agree with you. He is reflecting a kind of anti-Semitic attitude in, uh, in Merchant of Venice. Why don't we consider the same in Othello? Because I, th well, first of all, I would say, he, yes, he does reflect in Othello. Uh, I mean, there's no question that he reflects anti-Muslim and anti-Black. I mean, the characters speak that way. He's not right. I mean, and, and the characters in Merchant of Venice do. But even in the Merchant of Venice, I think what's surprising is that as he goes on, Shylock actually becomes more and more compelling as a human being. 
you actually enter into what it is to be Shylock in a world in which you're ruthlessly uh, oppressed by the people around you. And I think this, the, the mistake is, to th not your mistake, but I think the mistake is to think that anything a character says reflects what the author thinks. Characters are not the same as the author. They're in a play. And the question is, how does the play deal with these materials? Ahmed wrote before, even the black character in the play was not proudly black. But actually, Othello is proudly black. Othello says, uh, I fetch my life and being from men of royal siege. I'm royalty, he says. I'm from a royal, I'm not a nobody. I'm from a royal family. Uh, so that even in that play, where characters, in, in, likewise in Othello, I mean, likewise in Merchant of Venice, when you think you have the characters clearly in a negative position, they surprise you by revealing sides of themselves that you didn't know. Shakespeare is not a propagandist. He's not a propagandist even for the people that we, I, I would like Shakespeare often to be more on my side of this or my side of that, but that's not what he's in the business of doing. He's in the business of digging you deep into people's lives, making you understand what they are and making you, uh, unsettling you in your prejudices, not confirming you in your prejudices, I think. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, you. Yes, I can. Uh, we have a question from Rahaf and then a question from Ahmad. Okay. Uh, Rahaf, go on, Rahaf. Hi. My daughter. Hi. Hi, Rahaf. Uh, how are you, Professor? It's, I'm fine. It's a great honor. It's a great honor to meet you. I'm I'm a great fan. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to ask is that right now, as contemporary readers, we understand the racism of Iago, and we see Othello as a victim, and we see Desdemona as a victim as well. But like to to the audience of Shakespeare, would this would this play have been considered racist, or would they have been on Iago's side or on Othello's side, and would Desdemona been, have been seen like uh, be seen by them as as a free thinking person or as a disobedient daughter who deserves what happens to her. Well, Ralph, let me ask you: Do you think that any audience that you can imagine would think that the hero of the play was Iago? I mean, would would is it imaginable that anyone seeing this play or uh, in in sixteen hundred let alone now, obviously, uh, in, our, in 2020, but that, that anyone would think that, that this, this, whatever you think of Desdemona, whatever you think of Othello, but what could, is it possible? I don't think it's possible to think that, that anyone, I think the play, is, the play is ambiguous in lots of ways, but I think it's unequivocal in thinking that Iago is a hideous vic uh, villain. Don't you? And, I, sorry. I, I kind of agree, but the, the, the perplexing thing is that when you look at them, Iago is the one who speaks most in the play. Like, he's the one who has the, the biggest number of lines. Yes, so that's true. So does can't we, so, yeah. Can't we consider him the protagonist, like, not the protagonist, like can, the main character in some ways? Can I, can I say something here? I think I think Rahaf does have a point here. Uh, uh, the the idea is that secretary Bob. This is my little daughter always interrupting. Um, okay, so uh, the, 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 there is the issue here of uh, uh, again Iago being the protagonist in a sense that he is a white supremacist defending a white Christian Europe from being. Uh, contaminated by foreigners, by intruders, by black people, marrying the most beautiful woman in, in, in Venice. I think this, this is a valid reading in a sense. Uh, so the question that we could raise, uh, how, I'm not, I've, I've, uh, I've thought of this a little bit before, but Rahaf uh, has just made me 
think of again in the light of the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, what's going on in America right now, the protests uh, against uh, uh, pol uh, police brutality, etc. How do, for example, at least uh, white supremacists uh, view Iago? Is he one of, the, of their heroes? Like many would uh, look at uh, racist people as a source of inspiration or something? Well, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let me let me take a step back. First of all, to Roth's original point about the early period, about what someone in Shakespeare's audience would have thought. Now I'll come back to your question. It's not an accident that the character is called Iago. Who's Iago? Who's Santiago? Iago is Santiago Matamoros. His full name is. He's a. It's a Spanish name. It means James in Spanish, but it's a Spanish name, and it's a Spanish name associated with the Moor killer, Santiago Matamoros. Uh, and for the English in the early 17th century, the, the Spanish were a much more disturbing enemy than the Moors. That's, as I started by saying, that's what, what the Moroccan ambassador was in England for. So being called Iago automatically would have put Shakespeare's audience against Iago. He it's a Spanish name uh, of someone who actually, the, the hating Moors is, is not part of what anyone in the early, in Shakespeare's time would have thought was a particular, particularly attractive position. It's being Spanish that's the ugly part, uh, for a Spanish Catholic. We're dealing with a Protestant country who, that had been invaded by the Spanish. So there's, there's, Shakespeare sets it up for his own audience that way. But to go back to your question, Rafat, look, if you present uh, a, anything to a, if you're asking me what uh, a, ra a, a racist audience would have thought of Othello, first of all, I don't think a racist audience would have gone very often to Othello, but maybe they would have. There's a, even a story of someone attacking uh, trying to shoot in the South, I don't know if it's true, but someone trying to shoot uh, the, the character playing Othello on the grounds that a white man shouldn't kill, shouldn't kiss a, uh, a, a black man shouldn't kiss a white woman. Racist people, if you have a very strong racist view in your head, it's very, that's the way you see the world. It's like wearing glasses of a certain color. Everything looks that color. So I can't say that, that a particular person couldn't see the play that way. But uh, I think the overwhelming force of Shakespeare's play then and now is to call into question racism, not to reinforce it. And the fact that Iago has more lines than Othello, just as Richard III has the most lines in the play Richard III, but he's the villain of the play. It doesn't mean it's, it's not a great play it's a, or a great part for a character, but it doesn't confirm anything. I think that the play is designed to make you call into question your racism. And I think that if we see, in the case of, of George Floyd in Minneapolis, if you see an image of the mistreatment of, in this case, the judicial murder, extrajudicial murder uh, by a policeman of a black man, uh, it, uh, if it disgusts and outrages you, as it has disgusted and outraged most of my countrymen, it does so because you have moral values. Be and the question is, where do you get your moral values? Where do you get the sense that it's not appropriate to behave this way, that you can't allow people to behave this way? Well, you get it from a lot of different places. You get it from your religion. You get it also from your culture. And your culture is shaped by works like Shakespeare's works that say to do what Iago does to Othello is wrong. It's wicked. It's unacceptable. But also to do what Othello does to Desdemona is wrong because men are, men must not attack women. Men must control their anxieties to possess and, uh, and, and have the women absolutely in their grasp. The play allows the wonderful character of Amelia at the end to tell Othello that he's disgusting and crazy. He's disgusting and crazy the way a lot of the men in the play are disgusting and crazy. 
because they are manipulated. Uh -huh. They manipulate themselves into hating women. This is a play of, as much about misogyny as it is about racism. Well, Thank you very much. If, if, if I may add something, uh, you have just talked about the character of, of Iago from a historical perspective. How would the audience consider and have attitude against Tiago because of his own name? Yet, we are discussing the character of men from a modern perspective. Uh, why don't we consider, right, how would a man beat a woman in the 16th century? Uh, exactly like the attitude of men or the society against this domina uh, at Shakespeare's time. They would never approve what she did. Now, we might sympathize with this domina because she is in love with a man. But if I were uh, in the position of an Elizabethan man, I would not approve what uh, she did. And if I am in a position of a father, I would have not approved at all what she did. So yes. sometimes we might explain things from historical perspective, but we are not supposed to think of the characters from the 21st century, uh, uh, I mean, thinking. This is one, one point I wanted to talk about. Uh, something else I would like to add regarding uh, Yago as the protagonist of the, the play or not. I would say Othello, uh, the character of Yago is, I, I usually call it to my students, a one-man show. Uh, wh what I mean that oh, without Iago, we don't have what we don't have a play. That the play is designed around the the character of Iago. Iago. Why? Because he is the one who is making the play. If uh, if we want to make it consider the play as a play within a play, I would say the second writer of the play is Iago, not William Shakespeare. This is the second point. So it would be fair to consider Iago as uh, the main protagonist of Othello. Yes. And thank you for your patience. No, both, both uh, very interesting remarks. I would say to you first, two things. First of all, that uh, one thing that was, that's interesting about Shakespeare's theater, the Globe Theater, in, uh, or Blackfriars also in its time, is that both men and women attended. Uh, and there was no special separate section for women. Men and women both came to the theater. Uh, and in fact, in the, in the period, there are some people who write, men who write, it's not proper to allow women to come in such large numbers, not accompanied by any other men, just on their own to go to the theater. But that's the way it worked. The, the uh, women went to the theater, paid for their tickets. And so the women, it's not just that the play represents the male point of view, from the point of view, of the, it's not just that the audience is an all-male audience. The audience is male and female. And I think that Shakespeare actually is using that fact that the audience is both male and female to begin to undermine the misogynistic views of his uh, world. I think calling into question. So I think personally that though you're absolutely right that many men especially fathers would have wanted to control the marriage choices of their daughters, unquestionably true in Shakespeare's time. I think Shakespeare and, and Shakespeare himself personally may have wanted to, and he had two daughters. But I think that in this play, Shakespeare calls into question and undermines the misogynistic logic of his world, I think. About your uh, other point about, about Iago, I think it's deeply true. I completely agree that Iago is a figure of the playwright in this play, that Iago is someone who's manipulating, creating the scene. But I think that Shakespeare is calling into question the, also the exploring in a kind of very uncomfortable and disturbing way, the ethics of being a playwright of manipulating people, of moving them into positions, of getting, of, of using them, of using their emotional lives. And I think that Shakespeare actually was interested in a complicated way all his life in the ethical problems of being a playwright. And I think in Othello, he uses Iago to explore those problems uh, in the, the most powerful way he ever did in his work. So I agree, but, but not to say that he approves of that manipulation.
Okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, fascinating. I'm really mind blown uh, with the input. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ayman, for your, uh, again, uh, no wonderful ideas. Uh, we have two questions. We don't want to keep uh, Professor Stephen. Uh, uh, no, I must go. I'll, I'll take these two questions, Rafa, Rafa and then two I questions. will go. Yeah. Because, right. Okay. We have Ahmed, uh, Sheikh Khalil, and then uh, Malak. Ahmed, go on. Um, yes. Hi, sir. Um, thank you for this very informative and interesting uh, lecture. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Ahmed. Yeah. I have uh, two points quickly, uh, if I may. Uh, the first regarding the uh, the point I said before and the comments of him being a proud black character. Um, like, let's consider he's an Arab character too, because I think he is, and at least black character. And Shakespeare is a white character, reflecting him as a black character, speaking on his tongue. Um, as an Arab person, I don't think that I want to be represented this way. I don't think that there's any Arab or a Muslim person that wants to be represented this way. He's not a proud person. And even as a black person, which is clear that he is a black person, he was not proud. Uh, he always used the black, the color, as an insult uh, in many uh, quotes in, in the play. So I don't think that he was uh, proud. He, he wasn't proud of his origins. He always um, described the uh, Ottomans and the Turks as uh, barbarian and as uh, savages. This is not proud. And I don't say that Shakespeare is uh, anti-black. He is, in a way that, as much as his society, as I said, but like in the issue of women, like we have Portia. I admire Portia. If I, were I a woman, uh, many women say that they like Portia. They want to be like Portia. She's a strong, she's a witch, she's like a model. But I don't think that there is a black person who's proud of his identity, of his race, who wants to be like Othello. So I don't think that he was proud. And I think this is um, a racist point, a racist, uh, I don't know. I, I think that uh, it's common in, in England and Shakespeare did it. He was anti-black in this, in this regard. This is the first point. The second point uh, is that I really like the way that uh, you took us to the historical context of the play of Othello, the two uh, different versions of it, the differences and the significance of these differences. And I like uh, to understand text from this uh, historical point of view, but I like more the way that uh, you, you did in, in your uh, book in 2018, Try and Shakespeare and Politics, when you uh, brought Shakespeare to um, our, uh, to our days, to, to this day. Uh, and I, I know that you did not mention Donald Trump, but many critics, uh, I, I read the New York Times uh, review in the book, and they all, all said that it is about Donald Trump. And this way, thanks to Dr. Rafat, who brought uh, Black Lives Matter uh, to the discussion as we are discussing racism, I think that this is also important because uh, I like that did not mention uh, other uh, presidents and leaders in, in our uh, societies and our countries that are like Donald Trump and that uh, we understand them uh, the way Shakespeare understood them and analyzed uh, the mindset, the triumph of our, of our countries, like also the, uh, in, in our region. Uh, so I think that both ways uh, are interesting and I like that. But my question is, uh, you did not mention Donald Trump because you you said you you not want to mention him, but you uh, meant uh, this book uh, to uh, Donald Trump, or because you agree that it's not only about Donald Trump; it's about Shakespeare analyzing the political reader, uh, the the politicians, the, the leaders of the European countries. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for for reading my book. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to you. Uh, I, I'll say on the. On I, the... I did not read the book actually because I, I did not find it in Gaza. I read ah, some okay. articles about it. I, I wish yeah. uh, we could find it here in yeah. Gaza, but I don't know. It's been yeah, and uh, well, I hope it I hope it does get to to you. That that would make me happy. Um, I would say two things. First, on your first point. <clears throat> 
I mean, we maybe just disagree. I think it is possible to argue that, and this comes to a question that that uh, Rob uh, also asks online in the chat, that that he's insecure, that his insecurity about being black contributed to making him jealous and making him doubt Desdemona's affection more. And he does say at one point in the play, per, perchance because I'm black, and he, he's concerned that he's black and old, maybe that's why uh, Desdemona has stopped loving him as he imagines as believing Iago's poison and that she's in love with Cassio. So there's, it's possible to argue as you suggest and as Ralph suggests, he does say that. Uh, but I would say that in the play, what that reveals is that Iago has injected him with his poison. That Iago is, has, carries a vial of racist poison and he manages to get it into Othello's vein. But Othello at the beginning of the play, and I quoted those lines uh, a second ago to you, in act one, scene two says, uh, I fetch my life and being from men of royal siege, and my demerits may speak unbonded to as proud a fortune as this that I've reached. I'm, I'm, I'm not a nobody, I'm from royalty he says, so that he goes from, from that to thinking that he's black and therefore she may not love him. But that's Iago's work. Iago has managed to poison him that way. And that's so often what happens, which is that, that people whose views of themselves get undermined by the racist logic of the world that, that surrounds them. And I do think that that is one of the things that's depicted in this play. About, about Tyrant and Donald Trump, it's a longer, more complicated story. I mean, that, that my larger view is that, is that in the world at large, there's not just one particular leader, there's a whole set of figures uh, from uh, Bolsonaro to Orban to Putin uh, to, to, uh, I mean, one could go on with the list on and on and on, who represent a kind of, of uh, authoritarian power that Shakespeare understood very well because he lived in a world of those people and was trying to, to understand how people who didn't want to live under such figures could organize themselves, could think their way out uh, Shakespeare wrote at a time in which uh, you could be severely punished for any of those, for, for speaking freely. Uh, but he found a way of doing so in his work, and that's what I was writing about. So for me, it was, uh, I have, of course, a particular political view and a political world that I live in, and I was interested in engaging that. But I do think of it as part of a larger world that people, who, not only people who live in the United States, but people who live in many, many other places have to deal with. Uh, can I, I think because uh, Malak's question has already been uh, raised by Rahaf about uh, Othello's insecurities. Can I say one uh, last thing, maybe you can uh, give us a closure. Yes, of course. Uh, in, in, my, in my brief experience of teaching Shakespeare, uh, um, The Merchant of Venice and Othello, King Lear and, and, and of course Hamlet, uh, many of my students uh, found it very difficult to identify with Othello even to sympathize with him. Uh, despite, again, the fact that he originally he is an Arab or, you know, North African or originally a Muslim. And maybe this is partly due to the fact that he, uh, uh, he tries to find, to distance himself from Muslims as much as he can. He tries to appeal to white uh, Christians in Europe uh, by being their killing machine, by killing for them, invading people, killing Muslims for them. And you quoted him saying, have we turned Turks, you know, in the in this sense that uh, Muslims and Turks and Ottomans are barbaric, they are uncivilized, unlike us, European. How he tries to distance himself because he is still the other, the outsider, uh, by quoting how uh, the, the, the anthropophobic guy, the people whose heads grow between, uh, under their 
uh, their shoulders, trying to appeal to those white Europeans by telling them, I am different from those people from, uh, from Africa and the Middle East. I am good to you. Please accept me. And still, he doesn't get accepted. Even, even his last remark, how he uh, smote the uncircumcised uh, 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 dog and killing himself. Circumcised. We could, yeah. Uh, uh, we could raise here the issue of uh, Othello, uh, like the, the question here I probably I can raise in addition to my, my point that students in Palestine tend to sympathize even uh, with King Lear, with even Macbeth uh, and, 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 and uh, Shylock, but not, not Othello, not all of them, of course, uh, but I think more than half, uh, half of them. So probably the point I could ask, uh, turn it into a question at the end, who killed whom at the end of the play? Was it Othello the Muslim killed Othello the Christian as punishment for trying to appeal to assimilate in a society that is not accepting him? Or was it again uh, a final cry of despair of trying even to belong after what has, happened, has just happened uh, to, to him by again killing the Muslim part uh, in him? So who got killed? Yeah, at the end of the play, the the Muslim part in Othello, or the 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 Christian part of it. was he punishing himself, or was he even still, you know, distancing himself from Muslims and Arabs? Thank you, uh, Rafat. For the, it's a wonderful set of remarks and a wonderful question. Uh, look, um, and it's a question that refers to what what uh, I uh, said. I wanted to ask you all. Uh, about the very end, but I would say several things. Um, first of all, um, to go back to what Ahmed and what Raf have said about uh, Othello's doubting of himself as a, uh, as a black, I see this, we may not see this the same way, I see this as uh, the fact that he's drunk Iago's drink. When he says uh, that my face, which was as fresh as Diane's visage, is now begrimed and black as my own face. That's Act Three, Scene Three. That's a sign that he's drunk the the, the poison. Uh, it's not where he, be, he. That wasn't what he what he was at the beginning of the play. He wasn't ashamed that way. On the contrary, he was full of a kind of exuberant performance of what he was. So he's been poisoned by uh, by the racist Diablo. That's not a revelation of the shame of being black. That's a revelation of the success, the malevolent, malevolent success of the racism of Iago. That's the first thing to say. Uh, second thing to say is that I agree with uh, looking at Raf's remarks about, about uh, Muslim jealousy. I wasn't suggesting personally uh, I, I have nothing, I have no views on, on, I'm not Muslim, I have no views on Muslim men, Muslim women, and so forth. This is not my world. I think, and I don't think it was Shakespeare's world. I think that Shakespeare, as I said, started with the material that he got from, from uh, Al-Aslan, who says that, that the uh, Muslim men are, are jealous, prone to jealousy. And then he turned it back on the Christians. I think the play is about, not about Muslim jealousy, but about Christian jealousy, about the jealousy of, of Cassio, the jealousy of Iago, the jealousy of Othe Othello Rodrigo. as Christian. I think the play is, is an exploration of that. And finally, jealousy of and that goes back to Rafat's wonderful question, I think the play leaves open at the very end and ambiguous in a profound way, who is attacking whom? It's a suicidal act. But I thought, Rafat's your re remark is exactly where I am at the end. You, at the end, you can no longer tell. Uh, what he, a fellow thinks, I think, in some part of his brain, that as a good Christian convert, he's attacking the, the Turk, the Muslim. But I think the reverse is also true. He's, I think, killing himself as a Christian. He's killing himself. Uh, the, the situation has reversed itself. And it keeps reversing itself in the kind of 
of loop at the end. And as I say, strangely enough, he adds Indian and Jew to that. So we get Indian, Jew, Muslim, and Christian all in a kind of, in a kind of global nexus of, in this case, of uh, murder and suicide. And what is Shakespeare's word for that? And what is his culture's word for that? That's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It's not anything we should endorse or approve of. Okay, Rafat. Uh, okay, all of you. I want to thank you from my heart for taking thank the time. You very much. I want to wish you good health uh, and happiness and uh, peace uh, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Amen. Amen. We'll have a class. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, Professor Stephen Greenblatt. You're thank welcome. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Bye.